Hey everybody, this is Mark. We are sponsored once again by Engro Games. You heard about it a couple weeks ago and sometimes before that, and we are doing one final advertisement here for Reach and Okazaki. The Kickstarter is over. It was successfully funded, but it is remaining open for late pledges at engrogames.com slash shop until april 15th remember okazaki is a game about creating dna strands it's a trick-taking game with one or two players and reach is a two-player cooperative game both are 18 cards each uh, a number of stretch goals were unlocked for them so go, again go ahead and go to engrogamescom slash shop to check that out and get in on those games before april 15th when that's going to be closed up and now on to the show. Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 71. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Orion. Hello. And Matt. Hello. And we are talking about the best games of 2019. It's a couple months late, but I believe it is sooner than our best games of 2018 podcast, which was like in July. <laughs> but as as many of us know, a lot of the games come out later in the year because the conventions tend to be later in the year. It takes time to locate, play games, and even then I've got a list of like 40 games in an ideal world I would want to have played before making this list. But at a certain point, especially with the pandemic going around, I realized I was just going to play the ones that I have here in the home that from 2019 that I hadn't played yet. And then I was going to finalize the list, submit it, and put it out here for you all on the podcast. So what we'll be doing today is talking about a little brief stuff um, at the beginning about The Thoughtful Gamer. And then I'll be going straight down my top 10 games of 2019 I believe Orion and Matt have played a a few of them each, and probably different ones, mostly. But uh, I, I suspect there will be some disagreement and some agreement, which I, I, is the vaguest statement I could have said right there. Has that ever been untrue, Mark? <laughs> there will I mean, be... Sometimes... <laughs> Sometimes there's there will more, be some amount of agreement. <laughs> sometimes there's more disagreement than agreement. Sometimes there's more agreement than disagreement. I think this one will be right towards the middle on the agreement to disagreement ratios. <laughs> so if we were playing wavelength, you could use this podcast as a fifty percent. <laughs> yeah, sure. Right <laughs> if the scale was agreement to disagreement, it'd be about 50%. If you gave our podcast as a clue in Wavelength <laughs> for disagreement to agreement, I would give it like 20%, maybe 25% turn towards um, agreement. <laughs> I don't think we're that disagreeable with each other. We like a lot of the same games. It's true. I know for a fact that there are one, two, three, at least three games on here Matt likes a lot. Well, four, actually. And one, two, three, yeah, three or four that Orion likes a lot also. And there's, there's, some of those are different. And then a couple I think only I've played of, of us. Wavelength is not on the list, though it was, we'll call it an honorable mention. It's probably in the top 20. But I, honestly, Wavelength... I don't know, as a game, I don't think the game aspect of it is constructed particularly well. It kind of reminds me of, like, Taboo in that sense. Like, the act of playing it is really fun, but, like, the points are kind of meh. The points just no, it's not even as good as Taboo, because at least in Taboo you have, like, if, I don't know, if if one side takes an early lead, the other side can try more risky clues and trying to get them out quicker. Some more variable clue giving. And they get more panicked, and that's funny. In Wavelength, like, you're always trying to hit the bullseye, and you don't have the time pressure. And I don't know. The most fun in Wavelength is when you deliberately give subpar clues. Like, when you're not trying to play the game as a competitive game. Yeah, I don't know if I completely agree with that. I think the best part is just, like, the random conversations you have surrounding it. Yeah, and I think yeah. it's actually most fun when you're not playing it as a game at all. You're just giving clues and being funny yeah 
I don't know. Maybe we maybe we experience taboo differently. To me, it, it feels that sort of thing. Of the clue giving is really fun. Um, my enjoyment mostly comes from like the challenge to myself to give a good clue or at times a funny clue. That sort of thing. Kind of the bigger context of the game itself matters less. So, as you've probably heard, there's a pandemic going around. So I figured I would talk about that for a little bit in terms of the thoughtful gamer. That's not changing much. I, I do it all from home anyways. So uh, I, I've been kind of going business as usual. But I was thinking maybe there is something that people who listen to this podcast or who read The Thoughtful Gamer would like to see me focus more on during this time. I might do a list of like family game recommendations. Um, but I don't know what people want to see or what their priorities will look like. I've been trying to do more streaming. We did a couple of streams, uh, specifically on Twitch. I couldn't get it the simul stream on Twitch and YouTube to work. And Twitch is just a better UI than YouTube. So I've just been doing it on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash the thoughtful gamer with underscores between the words. Uh, and we'll try to do every couple of days probably i'll try to get something up streaming and then for online play we've been enjoying a lot of playing a lot of our favorite games online so if you're not aware uh the main in browser online game platforms that i'm aware of that i've been playing are board game arena which is probably the best one for real-time play i'm enjoying that one a lot although their servers are really overloaded so like during peak hours you've got to be like a premium member to log in sometimes although with the premium memberships like two bucks a month so i recommend it if you're going to be playing fairly frequently there's botteju i don't know how it's french b-o-i-t-e-a-j-e-u-x um which is a great one for asynchronous play and it has a lot of really nice euro games i've played castles hundreds and hundreds of games of castles of burgundy right now i'm playing some concordia and agricola there's Yucata, which I haven't had a ton of experience with, but it looks like it has some more classic Euro games and maybe some more obscure stuff. And we played Terra Mystica on it the other day in one of our streams, and it, the interface was actually pretty good. Um, so I was pleasantly surprised or pleased with that. There's Board Game Core, which has Splatter games. We've got a Food Chain Magnate game running right there. Uh, I haven't had a lot of experience with that one, but Food Chain Magnate Online is super exciting. And then everything else I've been playing in various apps. So on Steam, I highly recommend anything by Playdeck. They do uh, Twilight Struggle. They just released Labyrinth, which I got a code for, and I'll be streaming that sometime probably before this podcast airs. So this is more for the patrons, and if I like it, I'll stream it some more. Although if, you, if you've read my written review, you know I'm a little bit skeptical of, of Labyrinth, but Twilight Struggle... Uh, is obviously a brilliant game, and I've been enjoying playing that. What else have I gotten? The Terra Mystica app is pretty good. Or, excuse me, the uh, the Terraforming Through Mars. Through the edges? Sorry, the, the Terraforming Mars, that's what I meant. All these games that start with the letter T. Terraforming Mars app I played around with for a bit, um, and it's pretty good. The Through the Ages app, the mobile app, is excellent, and I'm actually in the middle of a game right now uh, with uh some other board game podcasters and the other app i've been playing is aval a v o w e l which is the digital unofficial official implementation of gilhova's wordsy which has a daily challenge that's super super fun and i've been enjoying playing that nearly every day although i miss some days and also I get, i'm very bad at that game i'm near the a bottom vowel? of the list a vowel yeah what did you yeah have you, you looked at it when we no, you showed me uh, when we were in line at PAX East. You seemed very good. I mean, I I'm off had a good game, round. So, <laughs> is that the one where you have all the cards that have like two letters on them, and you have to slide them up and down to make one word, and you keep adding cards or something? No, that's you're thinking of Wibble, which is going to get okay. branded soon. Uh, no, Aval slash Wordsy. It's it's a game where you're well, at least I forget how the point scoring works in the actual like rules for wordsy but the daily challenge is just straight points there's like bonus points given in the other version but you get a random set of eight consonants um and each column left to right is worth a descending number of points so you want to the the ones on the left are the most points and, uh, and it drops a point in each column 
So it's four columns of two letters. And you're just trying to come up with the word that uses the most points worth of letters. And you're not limited to those letters. You want to include them. So the idea is that it's a word game that's not quite as strict as Scrabble in terms of you can only use these letters. You're just trying to find the words that use the most letters that are displayed there. Um, okay. And uh, so the people who do really well come up with these bananas, super long words, and they just have a good knowledge of like what prefixes and suffixes work well and can be attached to certain words. And if I play for a while... I just like the concept of words starts to disintegrate in my mind. And I start just like, <laughs> I'll think of like something. I'm like, is that a word? I'm like, no, that's just a random collection of letters. And then I'm like, what are words really? <laughs> um, so don't play it for too long, but I, I am enjoying the daily challenge. Any, any, any things I haven't mentioned that you all have been playing in the board game future? I mean, um, shout out to, uh, magic arena oh of course if, yeah if you, if you haven't played that um maybe now's a good time to, to jump on it um the other thing is there are some really good party game implementations that are uber simple so if you're looking for something that just kind of lets you be more social with a group of people have a google hangout chat and um if you just search online code names, there's a great implementation. Um, and uh, it, the kind of things where it's not real fancy, but it, it lets you in a, in a video call uh, have the party game experience, which I know for some uh, more extroverted friends of mine have been really looking forward to some scheduled game uh, events with, with, with code names and categories, stuff like that. Oh, very cool. Very cool. So... Even if you're social distancing slash in quarantine, you can still get some good board gaming in. And every once in a while, I like dipping my toes into really playing a game over and over and over again. Like, I, I grinded out Seven Wonders over the last week or so on Board Game Arena and hit, like, the elite tier. And I think I'm ranked, like, 300th now. So that felt pretty nice. Yeah, how was um, yeah, the experience of playing online is nice that so many of the little piddly things uh, become so much easier to, to handle. Um, can you talk about your Terra Mystica game the other night between the four of you? Because you guys played that live with audio chat. Yeah. Well, one thing is that it's remarkable how unfiddly Terra Mystica is. Like the online game <laughs> took just the same length as a normal game. Because there's, I mean, part of it was that we, it, you know, there was some internet connection issues and we were chatting. But, like, I realized most of the way through, like, there's not a lot of, the time spent you would be playing that game online is the same kind of time spent that you would be playing it in person. Notably, like, thinking and calculating. The actual, like, yeah. movement on the board and the calculation the game has to do is so small. Also, what a game. It's a great game. <laughs> it's a great game. Love it. Other games can go by crazy fast, like Seven Wonders Online. I get through a game in like ten minutes. Lost oh, Dominion is... Online. Oh yeah, of course. is is solid. Um, when we played that the other night, we were chatting. It's maybe you just don't have to set up and clean up. The game itself takes about the same time. <laughs> yeah, there's not a whole lot. Well, it's we were a, it's also a playing bit faster. Relatively it... unknown cards, so we were kind of. If we were playing with sets we were more familiar with, I think it would have gone much faster. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah. For me, it there's was a still, lot of like remembering what the cards do. Yeah, there's still it. It saves you time in shuffling and drawing a hand and counting your money and things like that. But all the decision, basically, all the decision time <laughs> is still the same whether you're playing over the table or online. It's just the counting and physically moving things around the computer does for you. Yeah. Uh, and some games, that's a much more significant part. Terra Mystica was fairly low, and it had animations for most of the things, so it wasn't actually that much. It wasn't really faster. Uh, Dominion was a little bit more, but not too bad. Something like Seven Wonders, where you play a thing and three other people have to then pay money, or you're paying resources around and transferring money. All that stuff takes time, and calculating the military and um, well, the computer costs because it'll just tell you how much. Oh, extra right. money you yeah. have to spend for any given card right away, which cuts down a lot of time. Yeah. 
So I can see that one being a yeah. lot faster. And then the Through the Ages app, like you can get through a game, a two player game of Through the Ages against the AI in like 25 minutes. It's way fast. Yeah. That the app also has a bunch of fun challenges where it puts you in some sort of different disadvantage disadvantageous situation and you have to try to make up 30 points in the AI or whenever you do something they get uh, resources or victory points or d- different things like that just to just to spice it up an already great game and then you know more replayability so that's been fun yeah so there's lots of great resources I know if you're looking for new stuff I've seen a lot on Twitter where game designers are releasing little print and play games games are coming up with Jeff Engelstein released a print, the print and play of his new roll and write game, which is based on pinball machines, which looked pretty cool. So uh, the board game community has really, uh, really been pretty awesome uh, helping out people who want to play games but can't go out and meet up with their game group anymore. So having said that, let's go to my favorite games of 2019. I'm going to count down the top 10 I played around 40 to 50, I think, games 2019 releases. As I've done in the past, I am defining a 2019 release by whatever it says on Board Game Geek. So I'm not going to sit there and look up when it was released in America and try to figure out that kind of stuff. Whatever it says on Board Game Geek, that's what I'm going for, and that's how I've been consistent. Um, what I did is, to come up with this list, is I took the the games I think I rated a seven and above, which was like eighteen or nineteen of them, and put it in the Meeple Realty Sorter app thing, where it has you compare one-on-one comparisons until it generates the list, um, and I just went with that. Before I get to number ten, let's talk about a special mention uh, because it is a reprint. I'm going to call it a reprint and not a new edition of the game let me explain so there are three games on the list that are kind of sequel slash new editions of older games and this is kind of arbitrary but from what i understand the changes in the new dune are relatively minor if barely anything at all in terms of gameplay the ones i am including on my list as new games have significant changes from what I've researched and have been told. So maybe I'm wrong about Dune, and if I am, you can stick it somewhere in the list or just consider it another add-on to the list, because if I had considered it a new game, it it would have definitely made the top 10. Uh, But I'm considering a special mention as a reprint. Um, It was super fun to play. I can totally see why... It was a grail game for so many people, game people really wanted back in print for a long, long time, uh, because it was really fun, and I think, even just based on one play, I think pretty definitively better than those designers' other notable game, which is Cosmic Encounter. Yeah, Dune was super fun. We played it at G2S, right? Yep. Set aside a day for that, and had an epic diplomacy battle you know the whole experience of dune which is just such a cool rich story and world and everything um but we got to go round and round and uh it turned out that despite all the money of the spacing guild the benny Gesserit and the emperor were too strong of an alliance and they uh they they won the day so yeah being uh, the benny Gesserit felt good our, our, our powers were strong <laughs> yeah you just whispered in people's vo- ears and they're like, oh, I just won't defend myself against the knife in your other hand. That's so fine. Yeah. And people were commenting that like, oh, yeah, it definitely feels like an older game. I don't think so at all. I thought it felt remarkably modern and fresh in terms of game mechanisms. It didn't feel like an old game from the 80s to me. It felt I, I wouldn't you know if it came out brand new this year, I wouldn't have been puzzled by it. And I think it's just a lot more immersive interesting game than cosmic encounter and also more interesting than many other diplomacy heavy big war gamey type of games i mean yeah. other than twilight imperium this is probably in that style of game this is probably my favorite one that i've played yeah i really enjoyed it and loved it i thought it felt reading the rules the night before i thought it felt like an old game just from the way the rules were written things like 
you have a stack of armies and it's one per, you know, one strength per army and you get one move and uh, at the end of the round, a random space gets destroyed. And if you're there, you lose all your troops and just things like that. It felt like an old game. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It just, it felt like an old game. I don't know how else to say it. Yeah, but even a lot of that stuff was not as chaotic and not as random as you would think. Like, all of that could be mitigated and foreseen to some degree, and then it was just a matter of, like, you know, risk analysis. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Again, I mean, I thought it was a great game and loved yeah. it. I think it was really fun. I, I I hope I'm able to play it again at some point. <laughs> Yeah, we've been talking about playing it for, what, a year and a half now or something and finally something got it to like the table? Finally, well, that was before the new one. I think it was more than a year and a half because when one of the guys we played with was like, I'm going to try to get a game of Dune up. That was before the new one was even announced. We, he mm-hmm. has the, the original, and then the new one came out. We got to play. Yeah, I'm jealous you guys got to play it when this uh, stay-at-home stuff blows over. We're going to have to get a... I just I think it, it looks so fun to play with with seven people around the table. Was it was it seven or six? S- so six, six, six but, factions. Yeah. yeah, yes, six factions. Yeah, and you yeah. want all six, right? I think you want exactly six. It's one yeah. of those games that's really best at precisely six. What yeah. we need to yeah. do is get our hands on a copy of Dune, set aside a Saturday, and then we have a six-player game extravaganza where we play Dune and we play Westphalia because those both of those games are <laughs> precisely six players. <laughs> Doesn't um, the Reformation game also want that? <laughs> yeah, and then we'll then we'll wrap up with a quick game of Here I Stand. Yeah, there we go. I mean, uh, West Folly is only supposed to be like 90 minutes, I think. So that'll be our filler game. Perfect. <laughs> we could have a, a six-player post-quarantine celebration weekend. It'll be wonderful. All right. Let's move down to number 10. Oh, w- uh, wouldn't it be up? Are we moving up to the top 10 and we continue to rise? What do you mean? Oh, you said move down to the top 10. Oh, well, sure. Up, down, it's all relative. It's a space list. True. What is up? Fair. <laughs> Speaking of space, I just watched this video from this uh, astronaut, uh, Chris Hadfeld, who has been on the International Space Station and was commanding it for a while and has done you know all sorts of stuff. Really cool guy. And he went and reviewed all of these famous space movies and talked about the ones that were ridiculous and how this would never happen and how this part of it was good and, and whatever. It was, it was a really cool video. Have you not gotten into the deep dive of those videos? It's like a whole YouTube genre now. Yeah, after I saw that one, now I have like six more of, you know, famous Jewel Thief reviews Jewel <laughs> heist movies and oh, yeah, Explosive all... Engineer reviews this. and Yeah, they're all really fun. I, I get YouTube recommended them constantly. Um, yeah. And they're actually there's like four or five major like major media channels that do one like every few weeks maybe so there's just a constant stream of them coming in oh cool yeah it's a it's a whole thing well it started with the accent guy that was the first one wired magazine did it remember with the guy who did accents and dialects yeah you showed us that one yeah that was the first one that started this thing and now like everyone's doing them oh okay yeah Anyways, we're going to move some direction on a list from 10 to 1, starting with number 10. Oh, I forgot to mention, uh, before we get to this one, notice notice the suspense. Oh, man. Building. Oh, what? man. It's killing me. I think we need to take a break, and we'll come back next week with the rest of the list. <laughs> before I get to the number 10 that I haven't mentioned yet, drum rolls you can imagine in the background i actually did some some data digging into these games and i because i realized that the list is like entirely light games and super heavy games and i looked on board game geek and it was actually shown to be true at least according to board game geeks ratings i would consider a medium weight game to be like two and a half to three and a half on their weight rating and only one of them fits in there so every game here is above three and a half out of five on weight or below two and a half. 
I believe it was four light games and five heavy ones, or maybe it was five heavy or five light games. It's one, two, three, four. I don't know, five light games, four heavy games, and one midway game. So uh, I guess 2019, 2019 had a lot of good party games, and it had some good heavier stuff that I liked. Yeah, a lot of now I think about it, a lot of the medium weight games I played kind of fit into that like six to seven out of ten range, so not making the top list. Anyways, I thought that was interesting. Number ten, one of those light games you heard about it before on this podcast, Goat and Goat. Goat and Goat. Goat and Goat. Game of Unplugged, right? Yeah, I mean for us at least. <laughs> Uh, we showed it to some other people at PAX East. Some of them liked it. Another one was like, "It's just like a, it's just like a filler game, like a bunch of other filler games." And it is, but there's something about it that elevates it over other small filler games that I've played. Over many yeah. of them, at least. Partially, I think it's the really nice artwork. It's again coming from uh, East Asia. They have that super clean artwork. It looks great. There's goats. Um, okay, Mark. Would it be as good if it was some other animals? Oh, like I have no particular... S- squirrel and squirrel? Love of goats. I would love squirrels even more. Narwhal no... and narwhal? Yeah, you could have it... Think of the well, possibilities. I believe it is a sequel to another game called Sheep and Sheep. <laughs> ah, so you that, could that's... have a whole line of games. Cow and cow? Uh, I mean, cows are kind of dull. But goats oh, are kind of wow. good, but it could have been any anything animal. but cows. There's no theme goats, to the goats game. Goats climb mountains, at least. Yeah, uh, yeah, true. They yeah. they've got that weirdly you like said, slightly obese yet nimble quality. You said almost nothing substantial about the game to this point, what which is fair because it's just so, like you just it, it's a great filler game. You just want to play it. Well, it's got one really cool mechanism, and that is that you want to play. Ideally, you want to play low-numbered cards because that keeps you more flexible for the future. But the lower-numbered cards you play, the fewer cards you draw. So you have to balance the future flexibility with actually accelerating your game and getting scoring points and such. Um, Which is a really cool kind of push-your-luck decision right there. And I think it's just really fun. Reminds me a little bit of like Lost Cities in in that sense. I mentioned because I've been playing Lost Cities on Board Game Arena. And I, I, was I, like say, game. I was gonna say that reminds me of King Domino, which is the light game that I just learned. Um, where you're trading like immediate better dominoes for less future flexibility. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. but I mean in, in a in a simple game, there aren't that many ways you can make it great. That's you, you want some kind of tension. Yeah, I think there's it. something about that trade off in light games that I really like. Because, again, it's a lot like Lost Cities, and I really like Lost Cities. So, uh, Goat and Goat, my number 10 of 2019. Number 9, we shift over to... We're going to 9? I was... Yeah. I was what a coincidence. <laughs> Wait, because it's the next number? I don't know. The way you said it earlier, I, I was in complete sense about what number was going to come next. Oh, okay. Well, it's number 9. And then who knows what we're doing after that. Number nine, one of uh, the heavy games on the list, one I really, really want to dig more into because it's the first game in a very long time that actually like beat me up when I played it. Actually, very much like a- another heavy game farther up the list. So I guess 2019 is a year of punishing games. I don't know. There's no theme to this. I'm just trying to draw narratives. But anyways, number nine, Cooper Island, which is, man, it's a it's a... Very tight worker placement Euro game that feels a lot like Agricola and that you want to get a lot done and you have no idea how you're going to make that happen. And much like my first play of Agricola, I did not make it happen at all and felt like I completely failed. But that just makes me want to play the game more and figure out how certain things can actually be accomplished because it feels like there's not enough time to do it. So that makes it a very intriguing game to me. Uh, it's a pretty game too. Um, looks nice on the table. It's got an interesting score track thing and, and, and a good amount of interaction um, for this kind of puzzle Euro game uh, or mechanical Euro game, you might say. But 
I did. I wasn't sure if this was going to make the top ten when I first started the rankings, but I think the fact that I just really want to play it again to try to figure more of it out uh, is what is putting it high in the list. So maybe after five plays, I wouldn't rank it necessarily as high, or maybe I'd rank it higher. I think one way or the other, it's going to move up or down. But after one good play of it, I I just want to play it again. That's why it's number nine. Oh, Ryan, did you check this one out? I, I missed this one. No, I haven't played this one. Yeah. It's it's very much grindy like Agricola, a bit more complex, um, but very much yeah like it, I mean it it's right. almost along the same lines of of Crystal Palace which we did not like but a bit tighter and meaner and I think a more interesting puzzle. I am developing a theory about these kind of punishing maybe a little bit more tactical games that. So far, you've liked a lot more than I do. And once we get up the list, I'll talk more about this. And I don't know if this is actually correct, but uh, why not throw some more suspense in? So look forward to that later in the podcast. Ooh, more suspense. We're getting good at this. Are we? Are we just doing it a lot? I mean, if you layer suspense on suspense, it only it just <laughs> multiplies suspense. All right. Um... Listeners, tweet at the Thoughtful Gamer how suspenseful this podcast feels. <laughs> On a scale of 1 to 10, how suspenseful is the Thoughtful Gamer podcast? All right. Number eight, going back to light games, is the party game Stay Cool, which is precisely my kind of party game because it looks like a party game. It is easy to learn like a party game. And it inspires laughter like a party game, but it's very difficult and frustrating on occasion. <laughs> oh, this is the one where, like, you're trying to do three things at once? Yes. And it's Oh, your the, like, opponents. social anxiety one. Well, not social anxiety. It's like... Okay, that's true. Computational anxiety, maybe? Because your <laughs> opponents are feeding you like trivia questions and other questions like spelling a word or name something blue to your left or what is your favorite restaurant or all kinds of things from like personal opinion to, to trivia to math. So various degrees of difficulty in terms of like just computational difficulty but there's two of them doing it at the same time, and one person you have to verbally answer, the other person you have to spell out the answer using these dice, these D6s that have letters on them instead of numbers, uh, which is really frustrating because there's only some letters on them. It's not the whole alphabet, so you have to figure out which letters are on which dice because they're all different. Um, and that's the easy mode. The more complex one, you also have to keep an eye on a timer and not let it run out before you flip it. Um, and you get a certain number of flips before the, your turn is up. It's just that kind of mental challenge and like panic is, is just great, great fun. I really, really like to stay cool a lot. You know, it's kind of the same thing as like that, uh, that what was that computer game? Keep talking and nobody explodes. It's, it's that kind of thing, but in yeah. a lighter party game where you're kind of just going around and taking turns getting the fun role, I guess. Although I like the clue-giving role and keep talking. Um, I, yeah, I really want to try this. Role. Yeah. I uh, feel like I, I would be terrible at it. Um, from what you said, like, um, does some of your debate experience give you a, a leg up on this? Or is this just yes. like, yeah, okay. The best debate I've, drill is actually something very similar to this game. It forces you to say things and then think about something else simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, I mean, I I, I want to see you play it, but I I think it sounds like a, a fun thing to try. Maybe maybe like play it once and then not play it again. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a great fun, and, and in terms of, like, straight-up party games, it's my favorite of the year by a good margin. Like, we talk about it. I enjoyed Wavelength, that's fine, but this is, like, a proper game and is something novel and interesting, and I, I know, I think just got its English release because it's from a French-Canadian company. 
Um, but it's the same people who made Decrypto. All right. What number are we on? That was nine. Wait, no. That was eight. What are numbers? Well, my note taking the numbers got screwed up, so I'm having to like reverse engineer the numbers. It's fine. What are numbers? What are spaces? Some things you may be thinking when you play our number seven, or my number seven, I know I say ours, this isn't your list at all. You're just mocking it. Number seven is the son of Dr. Esker's notebook. I put the first game in this series on my top ten list last year, and I think this one is even better than the first one. I've played a few exit games during that time also, and while I'm enjoying the exit games quite a bit, and they would, if I had played a 2019 one, the ones I've been playing are a few years old, uh, maybe make the top 15. Like, I'm enjoying them. Uh, but I think in terms of a straight-up puzzle-solving game, this is my favorite one yet. Son of Doctor, Esker's Notebook. It's a really clean system. You don't destroy anything unlike the Exit games, so I've already passed on my copy of it to someone else. The puzzles are very challenging, and this one I don't think there's a stinker among them. The first one, there was one to two puzzles that I didn't love, and there's some better puzzles here. That, you know, Some puzzles are better than others, but I don't think any of them were disappointing. They were extremely challenging, but super clever and interesting, and I treated it just like a, as a nightly you know, sit down and spend 45 minutes trying to figure out puzzles. Um, over three or four nights, and it worked brilliantly that way. I found out that Amber is very good at certain types of puzzles because there was one I was stuck on for like 30, 40 minutes, and she came up and solved it in about two minutes, uh, which was great and also frustrating because the solutions seemed like, like good puzzles. It seemed obvious in retrospect, but uh, a fine collection of puzzles, um, also it's, you know, a small time independent self-published thing. So I recommend you support them, uh, cause he's made quality work here that, you know, could easily get a, a big publishing release. I think, I think it's that clever and interesting of a puzzle game, escape room style game, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. This is one that I would love to play. Um, but I was not around, I think when you were playing it, so I yeah. will try it at some point, probably, hopefully. I think, uh, I think. Bubba bought a copy, so maybe when he's done, we can actually get another copy back around. And then I like these kinds of games that you can like solve and then just give to someone and just pass it around. I think that's a neat that's a neat thing. Yeah, maybe I'll just buy a copy. I don't know. Yeah, it's a good one. All right, before we get to number six, let's talk about our sponsor again. Thank you so much, Engro Games, for sponsoring this podcast for the third time, fourth time. Again, go ahead and check out the post-Kickstarter pre-order for Reach and Okazaki at engrogames.com slash shop. Uh, Reach your, uh, is a two-player cooperative game where you're working in three-dimensional space. I think actually by moving your physical body uh, in line with cards, they're, they're micro games. Okazaki, again, is a trick-taking game with one to two players. And I'm not quite sure how a one-player trick-taking game works, but... Presumably it does. And it's about DNA. So really cool themes on it. Number of stretch goals have been unlocked and will be included if you get your pre-order in before April 15th. Again, the website is engrogames.com slash shop. And that will be in the description. I'll put the link right in there. All right. Let's go back to the list. Number six on my top ten list is one that I know, I know for a fact, Orion and Matt, agree with me that it is a great, great game. One of the light games on the list, The Crew. Space games. You know how every time we talk about Space Alert, Matt gets really excited both because it's an excellent game and because we get to be a space team. Well, here's another game where you get to be a space team, and it's actually really simple, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. It's you take a theme and you kind of invert it and you're like, that shouldn't work, but it does. And you take a trick taker, but you make it cooperative. So you're given goals at the beginning of this person has to take the nine of clubs before this other person has to take the five of diamonds. And then you can't communicate and you play your hand and work it out so that those people win those cards. 
And in the game, it's actually different suits, or it, it's what different colors or something. Yeah, uh, it's one a bit through simpler than a deck ten. Of cards. Yeah, I think it's one through ten of four suits, and then there's a or one through nine, and then there's uh, four trump cards. Um, but yeah, this was great. And then there's there's a little story story blurb, and you get a scenario, and then you have to, you know, get some you know solve a, solve a hand basically, and uh, you're not allowed to tell each other what card you have. You get one communication for the round and you can put down a card and say this is the highest only or lowest of this color and that's the only communication that you really get to share and otherwise it's just intuiting based on having played trick-taking games and working out together if you know if ben needs to take this but i have the only card that's higher than that i need to somehow get rid of it or avoid it or void a suit so that i can win this and it's just a different sort of puzzle, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Now, to be clear, I only played this the one evening. Uh, so, and... so have we. I haven't played it more than that. Okay. Have you guys, Mark? Have you not played it anymore since then? No, we might try to tonight. Maybe. I've been okay. trying to get Amber and Emily to play with us, but uh, I feel like th- this is one of the greatest losses <laughs> to COVID quarantine is that I haven't been able to play more of the crew. Um. This was the last game I played in person with anybody. <laughs> but yeah, the um, like the little story blurbs in between give me the feel of the Space Alert rulebook. It's just kind of a fun, ridiculous story that ties mission to mission. But mission to mission, it just ramps up in difficulty and you have to be more clever about how you take tricks in a way that's just so satisfying. I don't know if you mentioned, Orion, the order that you take cards sometimes matters. Um, So, like, I need to take this card that'll be super easy to take when it's put down, but I can't do it until Lindsay takes this other card that's going to be really hard for her to get. Yeah. And there's different different variations of that. Like, sometimes you have to take them in a particular order. Sometimes you have to take this one last so it, it mixes it up, and I think we've only gotten like twenty percent in, and it only ramps up in difficulty and complexity. Yeah, and honestly, I, I I thought about it in the week after we played, and I'm like, I don't know how it's going to get harder, but I'm super excited for those those uh, group puzzles. Yeah, and I mean, I think it really distills down core principles of trick taking really well when it's a cooperative game. Because everyone everyone has to kind of be on the same page in terms of understanding the rhythms and the just the things you learn by playing trick-taking games that might get muddled in a competitive game where maybe someone just gets lucky instead of the, the best player winning a, a particular hand. Here, like, if people make mistakes, like, just everyone loses, and then you try to figure out where the mistakes were made, and it... In turn, if you want to like learn trick taking principles, this is like the game to do it in because your failures are so much more obvious. Yeah. So most trick taking games fall into a category of games that there are just a lot of norms that have been developed and they make sense. But every once once in a while, you play with someone who doesn't understand those norms and it throws everything for a loop, right? Like poker is an extreme example of that. Like good Texas Hold'em players really don't want to play with noobs because it's not the same game. And and I've had that experience with trick-taking games, hearts or even euchre. But I think that the fact that it's co-op resolves that tension and that it's your group together is trying to understand that optimal rhythm of play. It was just really satisfying to play. Yeah. And, and I saw, I had a little Twitter conversation the other day with someone who was like, listen, everyone, the crew is not a gateway game. Like if you don't have experience with trick taking games, you will not understand how to play this game. Well, and it will frustrate you. And that's true. Like if you have experience with trick taking games, yeah, it's a good gateway game into like new modern board games. But if you don't have that background, it's, I, I'm sure it can be rough because again, your, your mistakes are punished very quickly and, and obviously and if, you know, maybe you, you can stick through that and learn, uh, which I think would be a very fun experience for someone who hasn't played a trick-taking game before, uh, but don't expect it to be strategically easy. Because, again, like, we played 
we got up through level 10, I think, of like 55. And even in those first 10 levels, we had a couple of losses. And this is like, you know, the beginning, the easier ones. And we are all fairly experienced at trick-taking games, all of us who are playing. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, very soon we'll be getting to like real specific card counting. And we're not even like halfway th- through the difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there was the, a couple of fun moments where i would forget how to play because i'm like well in a competitive game i would be playing like this but because it's co-op i need to be playing like this because i need the lead to be in a certain space within the next two cards so that we can achieve these objectives in the right order um but normally my may, maybe my, normally my incentive is well just play your high cards first take your easy tricks and then figure out when to play your trump but it doesn't work like that in this game <laughs> because if you just if you just have all the aces and you play them all you're probably going to mess up someone else and so i know ben mentioned the same thing of he's like oh yeah, right co-op not not competitive it's <laughs> it's just different considerations um so that that was fun yeah and, and in terms i'm just going to throw this out here casually in terms of cooperative card games where you don't get to communicate with the people you're cooperating with, this blows the mind out of the water. No question. Would you say, would you say it blows your mind how much better it is? A little bit. A little bit. Okay. And I don't even dislike the mind. I think I would at least fine. say I would this at least say really that good. The, the crew is a game. So that's that going. <laughs> Shut up, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> no the crew is a lot of fun and when we're all allowed to gather again you should get it and play it all right that's number six the crew let's take a bit of a halftime break down our list to talk about games that weren't so great or were in a various other categories that i invented I don't remember what category. We did something like this last year, although I should pick like a best art category. Oh, wait, no. I know what the best art category is going to be. Oh, um, yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are you thinking of the same one I'm thinking of, Orion? Oh, there's a hands down winner for the best art of 2019. Like, I, I'm thinking of going a, away. <laughs> I'm thinking of one that is not that much better than the rest. Oh, wait, no. There okay. are three. God, we played there's... a lot of games with some great art. There's one that I think is easily the best of 2019, and it's not on your top 10 list. It's not on my top 10. Okay, so it's not the one I was thinking of. I am I think there are four games I will highlight for their art, and one of them is on my list. What's the game you're thinking of, Orion? Wingspan. Yeah, I mean, the art there is incredible. That's one of my four. I mean... No, Wingspan, It. I can't say enough about the production and the pictures of birds and how just beautiful and attractive and enthralling just looking at the game is the gameplay itself is meh it's fine it's not bad it's not great i didn't it wasn't i i didn't think it was anything special it you know it was fine um but the art was really the the part of that game that stood out yeah um i mean yeah that's kind of got to be it i will i would like to say parks a lot in a very similar vein uh, had yeah. astounding nature artwork. I mean, the production of those two games is just fantastic, all the way around. Yeah, um, and, and really similarly, fun. Parks wasn't amazing from a gameplay standpoint, but I'm considering buying it just because you know, with my family, that that theme is so appreciated, and the art is there to just be worth worth having on the table. <laughs> Is that like a coffee table game where you buy it just to have it on your coffee table because it looks so good? You know, I've never <laughs> I've never heard that category, but Parks would definitely be my first entry to that. <laughs> okay, cool. I'd also like to do the 2019 Ian O'Toole Honorary Award colon Ian O'Toole Illustrated Some Games. Because all of his games look great. Uh, specifically, I'm thinking of Escape Plan and Pipeline. <laughs> he just yeah. gets his own award for always being great, and all of the games he did this year probably look amazing. Those are the two I'm seeing. Okay, Mark. Question. I want to shout out Electropolis. Um, yeah. Because I think I think it looked great and like was just simple and the right palette. 
precisely what the game needed. Yeah, does, really nicely done. Does that kind of style remind you of Ian as Uh, Kind of, the pastels. He likes his pastels for sure. Because, um, I mean, Electropolis is is from Japan or, or I Asia? I Taiwan. Taiwan, okay. And, and I think a lot of the games that come from that region have a similar palette and uh, simplicity, simplicity uh, to them. That's great. But it reminded me, honestly. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, it was my number 11, by the way. Oh, okay. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Um, I it was, was a top a choice of... between, between it and Goat. And Goat. <laughs> I was going to give you some crap for not having Electropolis on your top 10. It but... barely, yeah. I would also like to give best physical components of the year to Pax Premier 2nd Edition with the coins. Those coins and those column things and the cloth mat, just pristine. I love it. Yeah, really fantastic. Anyways, there's our art shoutouts. What other categories did I have? Worst games. Any guesses here? You guys did not play either of these games that, I, that I'm going to list. Uh, Fry Thief? Nah, Fry Thief was fine. Oh, okay. It just it, it didn't reach uh, far. It did what it wanted to do. Let me scroll through your list of games. <laughs> I reviewed. I mean, we all we all agreed we didn't really like Crystal Palace, but I don't think you'd call that the worst game. It was oh, mediocre. God's Forge? No, God's Forge was again. It was fine, but yeah, it, that that it, it was, was one of those that. like really disappointing games because it looks incredible. Yeah, I thought shout you were out gonna... actually shout out to the illustrations yeah. of God's Forge. Those looked really cool, but no. the like. The awesomeness of the gameplay just doesn't live up to the, to the look. Yeah. So my least favorite game of 2019 that I played was Big Dig, uh, which I believe the youths would call like a nothing burger. Is that still a phrase? <laughs> I'm not a youth anymore, Mark. I don't know. You're younger than me. That is true. I am in a previous decade than you are. <laughs> Um, it was this little roll and write game that was just kind of nothing. Like, there weren't really any decisions. You just kind of did things. It looked cool. I liked the art, and that's one of the reasons I, I grabbed it uh, as for a review. But, yeah, it was real boring. At least it was over quickly, but there was nothing there that was interesting at all. I, I did do a re- that, review of that one. That's about the worst, best thing you can say about a game. And then the second one I'd like to highlight is Foodies, uh, which I played at PAX Unplugged, I think, which somehow takes Machi Koro and then makes it less interesting, but more balanced. So it was, it was like, why does this exist? At least go wild with it or like make it more complex or something. Anyways, those are my worst games of 2019. What's next? What else did I do? Most disappointing game, I, I'm going to call out Wingspan, because as much as I like looking at it, and I did give it one more shot at a con, uh, one of the local cons, and it's just, uh, it's not bad, it's just not great, and I want it to be great, and it's just a little too random, and goes on a little too long, and you're just kind of doing stuff and i don't feel like i make interesting decisions i'm just making decisions you know there's not enough interaction that i can tell like i want a tighter game in 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 that kind of game and that now that i've been playing like seven wonders online i'm realizing like how much superior something like that is to wingspan even though they share some similarities and feel just because it's tighter and the lines of strategy are clearer and it's not just about getting as many different cards out as possible. Like, it's notable that Wingspan has, I believe, every single card in the game is different, but that can often make for less interesting gameplay because it's all just so chaotic. I think there's some duplicate birds in Wingspan. Are there? There might be. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure there are. Not a lot. You see a lot of different birds in there. There are, there are a lot of different birds, but I am pretty sure I remember seeing multiples. Uh, most mediocre game I'm giving to Deep Blue, uh, the New Days of Wonder game. I, you can hear my full thoughts on the PAX East podcast, where I go into what made that one kind of a stinker for me. I, again, not bad. None of these games, except for the worst games, 
uh, that I mentioned are necessarily, I would call a bad game, but it's just like mediocre in a sea of, of good to great games. And then finally, my last category here is the most ambitious but not quite successful game, just because I want to mention this game in the... Point Salad? Is that, is that what you're thinking? No, Point Salad isn't ambitious. It just it, it sets its sights low and it meets those You sights. can make a salad with whatever you want. If you just want green peppers in your salad, you can do it. That's ambitious. Is this uh, Eco Smirk? No, I wouldn't say Ecos is particularly ambitious. It, it does use some mechanisms we haven't seen before. You Think back towards okay. the beginning of the year. This is a game that's trying to do pseudo 4X in a very oh, drop, darkish... Oh, the dropship game. The, yeah, what in was, like under two called? hours. Downfall. Downfall. The post-apocalyptic oh, okay. nuclear winter 4 x game. That's trying to go by real quick, but so many things just don't quite work with it. I thought it was ambitious in the way they are tr- really trying to compact decision making down super quickly and tightly. But a lot of it, especially like the visual design, was not great and it didn't quite work. But I want to give that one a shout out for for being ambitious for sure. Yeah, Mark, you wanted you played this more than I did. Um, I think I only got to play this once. And it left me with a feeling of I wanted to try it again, but it it didn't quite come together on my first play. Uh, so I'm disappointed to hear that it didn't get better on more plays. Well, I mean, there's a reason I haven't yet written out a review yet, and that's because I still want to give it one more shot. I think I've gotten three plays in, and I want to give it one more, and I yeah. want to see if I can if I can squeeze because there's there's some there's some things in there that are actually really interesting and cool. And I do like the designer. He's done some some good stuff. But I want to see if more card knowledge and, and stuff like that and knowledge about the pace of the game particularly um, will improve it. But the visual design is just so bad. It's so murky and muddy. And there's too many like tokens in too small places. And the production it brings it down. I think there's, there's an interesting game somewhere in, in there. There's a nugget of something didn't quite work so far but maybe more play will another play will give me hope and then maybe that'll lead to more plays and maybe it's good once you get dig in we'll see i want to give it that shot that's our halftime break unless you guys can think of other categories you want to add to this it's a categorical free-for-all here i'll just throw out pirate tricks because we helped develop that a little bit oh yeah play test or whatever um it was a fun trick taker yeah it's actually it's kind of a, a shame that the crew was so fantastic because otherwise Pirate Tricks would have been my new favorite trick taking game. Yeah, Pirate uh, Tricks was in it was on my short list that I ranked. I don't know where it quite fell, but it was somewhere in the top twenty. If you like trick taking but want a little bit more of a game, it's it's great because it has just a really cool bidding thing going on. Um, yeah, it's got the auction. If you want to if you want it to be a bit more zany, I would say. It's not as yeah. austere as like the classic trick taking games. There are a lot of fun stuff in there and is and we've really I mean in terms of games I've played in 2019, I guess I rather probably most of our plays were were 2018 for that game when we were play testing it, but we pull that one out still even after helping play test it and and provide feedback for the development process, we still pull that one out semi frequently to finish off a night. It's it's just a real pleasant game and trick taking is just a, a good genre of game to do that with yeah it's just fun yeah another trick taker in space you're not a space team that's true is, it is you are in space you're hit. not a team though yeah. you're you're pirates space pirates anthropomorphic space pirates although i mean it's not thematic in any way it's just a trick taking game <laughs> yeah it's just skinned in space <laughs> all right yeah. let's go down to the top five Number five, a game I was excited about going into the year because I got to, uh, to play a pre-production or pre-release copy at two PAX Unplugs ago, and I was very excited about it then, but it was an officially 2019 release. I've continued to enjoy it. In terms of, like, great family games, this is the one you want to get from 2019, Tiny Towns. Yeah, I was surprised this one was on the list because I it seemed so long ago that we were playing this. But I guess it uh, shows up on 2019, probably early in the year. It was in March release, I think. 
Okay. I remember because I talked to because we you know it was early December when we played it at PAX Unplugged, and I think he said it was like three or four months out at that time. Um, they okay. just had one of the preview copies, like the pre-production copies. Yeah, from when it came out, this was one that was just a mainstay of every game night we had because it's, I mean, it's just a really fun, puzzly kind of experience that doesn't overstay its welcome. It's got a lot of variety to it, um, just in terms of the different combinations of buildings. Like, you know, each building type can be one of two things. One of two? No, one of four things. So it's three or four. Anyways. There's a lot of individual variety, but the combinatorial variety actually plays a lot into it. How the buildings interact with each other is just as, if not more significant than just the variation in each individual building. Um, So each game presents, like a game like Dominion, presents its own new strategic puzzle for you to look over. Plus, everyone gets their special buildings based on cards that are secret that can play into that. And it's one of those games that's accessible, easy to teach, good production. I like all the little um, building pieces. But for people like us who play a lot of games, it presents a challenge every time you play. Um, it, It doesn't grow stale once you get un- an understanding of the principles and more knowledge about the game it continues to be a good challenge and, for, and to my mind that's kind of the perfect medium for a family weight ish game is yeah. that people it's fun to do like the basic things and just build buildings but for people who want to be competitive you can be very competitive in that game especially once you get to like peace blocking and like resource blocking uh, strategies, especially with lower player counts, can get really interesting. Yeah, for sure. I think one thing I found on this game is I've gotten a lot better of, about analysis paralysis in general, but it flared up again when we started playing this game. Um, <laughs> and just because it's like it's a family game, it 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 kind it looks nice and whimsical. You know, it looks like something that you could play with your kids. But like you said, like the resource blocking and uh, but it just it's puzzling in a way that you can get lost in in the decision making. I think the sort of puzzling when you stare at your grid, you have the sense of I should be able to work out the ideal play every time, and then you start going deeper of like how many different ways can I fit in another you know corner house in, into this space, and I think that's where some of the AP can come in of trying to optimize that and guess what other yeah. people are going to play and leave yourself flexible enough to not get trapped. Yeah, and then there's the the interesting puzzle of if you do like the same basic opening strategy as someone, you know that you and them are going to be calling out resource colors that that are fairly similar and and then you have to figure out when to diverge from following their strategy in order to beat them and oftentimes that comes down to your special unique building that you can build but you can get in these loops of like groupthink where everyone's building the same buildings and then at some point you have to find that point where you diverge and pivot and hopefully beat them um, or you get in these situations where you're the only one going for particular colors and everyone hates when it's your turn to call out a resource color uh, and you're somehow you're <laughs> able to you're able to be the outsider off of the group think and just mess with everyone's plans effectively. I, there's all kinds of these interesting interpersonal dynamics with that game. I love that moment where someone calls the color and half the table cheers and the other half the table groans. <laughs> it's like, not blue. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> yeah. We're like the one person just always says the same thing and no one yeah. ever wants it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there is an expansion that came out a few weeks ago for it. I was supposed to get a copy, but then uh, the pandemic hit. So I think I'll check in after things have cleared up a bit. Uh, to see if I can get a copy, because I would love to see what kind of expansion ideas uh, come into this. I know there's at least more variation. There's a money resource and a couple new building types. Uh, so I think it'll add a bit more depth, a bit more stuff, which is what you kind of want with an expansion to that game. Moving up or down or sideways to number four, we get to PAX Premier Second Edition. A beautiful game from Cole Worley, where they just ran their second printing Kickstarter, I believe. 
uh, if you didn't get on the first one. So they, they might have some copies going to retail and such right now. This is a fascinating game. It was the first game in the PAX series that I had played. And I think particularly the way it deals with pseudo alliances in the way its scoring system works is just brilliant so how it works is that there are these you're kind of taking on the role of afghan tribal leaders during some point in history where russia the british and the afghan government are vying over territory in that area of the world and you are allied with one of those three major powers at any given point in the game you have to be allied with one of them now, the points work is that if none of the powers have a strong enough foothold militarily, then everyone, you score based on how much kind of growth your tribe has had um, and how much of a presence it has. That's the kind of the basic scoring. But if one military power has a strong enough foothold relative to the others then only the people who are allied with that military power score points. And then they get points based on how like well allied they are, how connected they are to them. So on one hand, you want your military power to be strong, but only if you have the strongest alliance with them. Otherwise you're just getting second place points and will never win. So it creates these situations. And I haven't had a game yet where someone didn't pivot between allies at least a few times you know with different players because you're trying to set up a position where you can get points more than other people you can always set up a situation usually where you're going to get some number of points if you piggyback off of someone but you'll never win the game that way and that is such a cool dynamic to me that there are other parts of the game that i like but that stands out so much as, as such a fascinating part of pax premier all these actions that are kind of orthogonal to each other. And you can't just directly be like, well, I want to go here and do this. You kind of have to get a card that lets you do that, but then you need to shift the role, shift the government so that you can do that color actions to be able to place a, or to move your spies or whatever. And so there's a lot of kind of jockeying around on low economy and it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, I was going to say, this is a game that I needed to play again, like immediately after I played the first time, and I never did. So I, I, I don't really grok the systems in the game. They were so interesting and so mind bending on first play. But I do remember in my play, Mark, all that kind of alliance shifting is something that I was missing out on because it was my first play. Uh, but late in the game, I was able to maneuver with the spies around the edge. And there was just a really interesting tableau building where you could have this strategy of using primarily spies to do things. It, and honestly, I don't remember all the details, but it was just kind of it was almost like another axis that you could play on that just made made the game kind of deliciously interwoven complex yeah yeah no the spies are a big part of it because that's it's essentially everyone's tableau is another like physical location in which you can manipulate uh, some of your units there's the military on the actual play mat but then there's the spies on the tableau which is a really neat idea and and how i haven't yet done a very spy centric strategy but it's it's a very interesting part of the game. Everyone's tableau is a line, and they basically all connect end to end in a giant circle. So you can walk your spies around the court or the courts around the you know everyone's tableau. So I jump from the rightmost card in my court to the leftmost card in Mark's court and kind of march along. And then whatever card your spies sit on, they hold it for ransom, and yeah. that player has to pay you tribute to be able to use that card that you're sitting on. And then you can also potentially assassinate that card to, you know, remove things from their court, which could then impact the game board if you remove their control of a region. Um, so there's a lot of interwoven and different axes to play on. Yeah. Really fascinating game. One I would, 
I could definitely see myself liking even more if we dug into it. Again, once the once we're able to actually like physically meet again, I would love to have like a pack stay where we just play this one a couple of times because once you get it, it can be a fairly quick game, like under an hour and a half, I think. I feel like these would be great online implementation games. Um, you're not aware of any online implementations, are you? I am not. No. Moving on to number three, this is one I had as a reprint in the special mentions alongside Dune, but I decided, and I researched a bit, that it was different enough from the original to warrant a spot as a game of 2019 and not a reprint of 2019. That is Kalis 1303. I finally got to play Kalis. It's the new one, and there were more changes than I thought. I thought it was pretty much just a reprint, but but it there are a significant number of changes to simplify the game, and I can totally see why it's such a respected game. It's kind of the old school, again, along the lines of something like Agricola, where it's, you know, not as complex as the heavy Euros we're seeing today, but in some ways much, much more interactive and more yeah, more confrontational. They're not just these puzzles to solve. They're very very interactive with the other players where you're playing the players as much as you're playing the game. Kalos is a pretty straightforward worker placement game, but it has the provost dude on a horse who can block sections of the board from being activated. It was engaging. I like the production of this version. It looked pretty nice. And just the interaction and the, even like negotiations we were having while playing is something you don't necessarily see a lot with worker placement games. It was just really solid, just perfectly executed game. I, I really loved it. Yeah, I guess neither Orion nor I played this. No, I haven't played it. But I was there when you guys played it and uh, it looked phenomenal. Uh, I came in at the end of the game and just the tension between the various players' immediate needs just looks so intriguing. Uh, Mark, when I walked back to the table, you and Stephanie were were kind of negotiating with each other if you were going to help each other or not. And, and yeah, it just looked great. Yeah, I mean, for straight up Euro gaming, just brilliant, brilliant game. But it was not the top Euro game on our list that goes to the number two game. Definitely a game of more this modern, mechanical, puzzly, not super interactive style, but what a puzzle, what a great looking game, endlessly fascinating. Pipeline is my number two game of 2019. Our play, Orion, at GTOS really solidified it that even though I failed completely, like, was probably going to go into negative numbers or close to it. It was just real bad. I made some very bad errors. The just mental engagement necessary to navigate that game is so fantastic and so tightly done. I I really need to get myself an actual copy of this so I can play it more and just figure out how to be competent at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that play just... it. it, it it came together for me, and this is almost like the comeback game of 2019 for me, because my first play, I was pretty unsure of what I thought of it, and it was kind of, I don't know, maybe it was because we started it at, like, midnight, and I got locked out of technology because I, you know, happened to draw third, um, you know, star player. But the second, this this play was, it felt so much better, and it was really fun, and I had an idea of how the systems fit together and I was able to do meaningful actions and find synergy and um, ended up scoring a ridiculous number because of the, the objectives that were out. But yeah, no, this is the, after that second play, I love this game and want to play it a ton now. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it did take a second play for me and I think I might like it better at two than three, just because of how the competition for things goes and how it, is designed to scale but yeah this is an awesome game and i want to play it more yeah and, and maybe now that i think about it maybe the theme of the top 10 2019 <sighs> list is like cognitive punishment so we got cool <laughs> that beat me up pipeline beat me up son of Dos dr esker's notebook is the most difficult of the escape room <laughs> puzzly games i've played pax Pamir is cognitively difficult to to wrap your head around with a lot of 
uh, weird quirks and stuff you don't see in other games outside of this series. And our number one's the same kind of way. So stay cool, <laughs> stay cool, oh, and stay cool. Yeah, is is a cognitive punishment. 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 <laughs> Maybe that's why I like Goat and Goat. It's just such a respite <laughs> from all these other games I love, but hurt my brain. Goat and Goat. Yeah, doesn't pipeline. Hurt at all. Goat and Goat goes no. down smooth. Goat and Groat, Goat feels great. It's like the chaser to all these other hard games. Well, in some or ways, Tiny Towns punishing games. also. Yeah. Tiny Towns sure. <laughs> aren't punishing necessarily. They're, they're, they're Tiny Towns, in, in a way, is the most punishing <laughs> light family game. <laughs> I don't that know. I've but you could be fine at the game very easily. Yeah, but if you want to be more than fine at the game, and aren't more than fine at the game, it's really punishing. <laughs> but that's true of any game. Like, any game that has decisions and a good number of decision-making. Uh, I don't know. If you want to be so, the best at that game, it's going to be, you know, it's a matter of expectations. As far as family games go, Tiny Towns punished me uh, more, than, more than most. What I'm saying um, is, but, if you but. want to be competent <laughs> at Cooper Island, stay cool... Esker's Notebook, Pax Premier, Pipeline, and Number One. If you want to be okay. competent and feel like you're not failing, it takes some work. That's that's what I don't I'm know. saying. Yeah, fair. What tiny I'm saying town. is you should just <laughs> let your town be tiny. What I'm saying is back to Pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> this is another one that I only played once. I played a bunch of these one time. Because a lot of them I played with you at conventions, Mark. But in that one play, I, I, I love Pipeline. What do you guys think of the kind of side puzzle of setting up your machine? Because because in the first play, that was something that I just had a lot of fun with. And in this like punishing game where you know the actions were somewhat limited and the oil was somewhat limited in the central market. I could kind of like go back to setting up my pipe machine. I don't know. The second play, I didn't have much trouble setting up the pipe machine efficiently. I think it becomes a game of recognizing which pipe tiles you need to get. And then it goes back to the worker placement dynamic. And the worker placement dynamic is just crunchy beyond belief. And so yeah. just once you understand and can recognize what pipes you need and what pipes are going to allow you to be super efficient in just the number of tiles, the actual like arranging them becomes almost a, a cognitive break compared to the rest of the game. But it's, oh, it's, it's such an interesting game. It looks, again, it looks fantastic. It's that, you know, tool art, super clean. And it's, a, it's a game like just repeating myself now, but it's a game where, if you make mistakes, you will be punished. And and I I think I'd like those games. Am I becoming more masochistic in my preferences, guys? Is that what this is amounting to? I don't know. Maybe, you, maybe you this came year. Up, <laughs> what happened in 2019, with, uh, Mark? I don't know. <laughs> it was a fine year. You came up on it. innovation this year. That's a punisher. Eh, innovation? <laughs> I don't know. Innovation's just wild. It's just got a lot of stuff going on. One more thing on Pipeline. This game would be so much faster online because there is so much setup and little bits and stuff everywhere. Oh, oh yeah, my the gosh. The setup's a bear. The setup is intense. The setup takes longer than it than the teach, actually. Probably, yeah. There's a lot of a lot of bits and pieces there. All right, let's go to number one. No suspense <sighs> necessary. I think I've mentioned before in another podcast that this would probably be my number one. And further plays have at least reaffirm that to some degree, this is Pax Transhumanity. And honestly, the top four, I mean, if I shuffled them up and put them in any order, I could see them being fine there. The top four, notably all heavy games, I tend to like heavier games. Uh, the top four are kind of the top tier this year, I think. Both the Pax's Pipeline and Kalis, I think, are a little bit above the rest. And I just put Pax Transhumanity at the top because I think it is, it was kind of unexpected how much I enjoyed the game. And I think the dynamics are just so fascinating and so, 
so interesting to try to work out. And I'm just to the point now after four plays where I kind of have an understanding of how I can look at the board and say, okay, I can accomplish this thing. And I'm not even at the point where I'm looking at barely how do I win the game or how do I interact with other players in an effective way to make sure I can put myself in a position to win the game. It's just a point of like, oh, I know I can accomplish these things and I can use my resources in such a way to make those things happen. And those are going to be somewhat positive for me. And then I'll worry about those other worries later. But I think the game is incredibly thematic. It feels like competitive research where there's all these possibilities out on the table and you're fighting kind of passive aggressively with other players to accomplish those things in such a way that you move up faster in the world of like cutting edge technology in order to capture the next thing that comes down the line that becomes viable. All of that is so interesting to me. And, and I really at some point want to dig into the thematic nature of the game and how it posits kind of a, a speculation about how the future will unfold in terms of technological advancement. But I'm still trying to re- get my head around what in other games would be fairly basic stuff, um, because it is an obtuse game. I think it's more complicated than Pax Premier, even though it is in the same umbrella of games. It's a pair more complex, I think, but I, I like the theme of it better, and I like I like the interactivity a hair better with the other players, or at least the potential for that kind of interactivity. Pax Premier, it's a bit more... The interactivity is a bit more flagrant. It's, it's not flagrant. It's a bit... It's more right there in front of you. The interactivity in, in Pax Transhumanity is a lot more subtle. You can really mess people up if you just do something with a card that they that they set up to do something in their next turn. You can really block what someone else wants to do. Yeah, in you really in direct you, ways. And you could go around and play the spoiler and just get in everyone's way, but you wouldn't necessarily progress your own agenda that way. So it's finding the moments in in the. Oh, yeah. Figuring out the priorities of when it's worth it to interfere with other people is the game, is a big part of the game, I think. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. I was trying to figure out what the the more direct moments you were talking about are. Um, At least in my play, there were a handful of times where someone did something, someone chose to do something that someone else wanted to do. It was kind of devastating to their next next turn. Yeah, no, it um, happens. I'm just saying, Pax Premier is just straight up more militaristic. Like you're, you can attack the other players. You can kill I see their cards saying. in their tableau. It's and, okay. and typically you want to do those things in transhumanity. It's a bit more nuanced and subtle of when you want to do that and when there are the key times and how do you manipulate manipulate the cards how you manipulate the viability of certain technology types to your benefit all that all that kind of stuff is more less direct than in- yeah maybe maybe i just found it more punishing like perhaps not that pa- pax vimir was uh a generous game but in in transhumanity if you I mean, it was so easy to just get set back a couple of turns. Things if you if you didn't plan correctly, or yeah, if that's, so, that's true in Pamir also. Yeah, the first yeah, game I, I basically got set back about half the game because I didn't understand a certain dynamic in a certain. Hmm. Okay, I didn't understand the implications yeah, of a certain. I, rule I guess it and is. I just got stuck. I guess it is common. In the Pax games. Um, or you have the I situation felt- like when me, Orion, and Bubba played where Bubba hoarded all the money and Orion and I kind of got stuck because of that. <laughs> yeah. 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 We were, we, at the end of the game, I think Bubba had 14 coins and the game started with 12 or something. And there's very few ways to add money to the economy. It's almost completely yeah. a closed economy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe I didn't grok transhumanity as much as I did Premier in the first play, which is crazy because Premier was mind bending. But I found transhumanity just in- incredibly punishing. It was just I it was just so hard to do anything, and 
you know, if, if you didn't, you have to understand if someone else is going to do something that messes up your plans. Because if you don't see it and then it benefits them to do something that messes you up, it, it's devastating. In in the short term, at least. Yeah. I think you'll um, find that that aspect of the game is far less significant on your second play when you can foresee, okay. you can foresee things a bit better. Because I think I taught the game to Orion and Amber much better because I had a much better understanding of the rules than when I taught it to you. Um, and they didn't have much trouble like getting to commercialize things, whereas gotcha. you struggled a bit to to get viability and such for commercialization. Um, just because I was still trying to figure out the game at that point. Hey everybody! Turns out that goblins ate this part of the podcast. It was even the best part of the podcast. And I go back to edit, and I'm editing it right now. And it's completely gone. We're right in the middle of our conversation about Pax Transhumanity. And then Orion presents his theory, and it's just completely missing. We've never had this kind of technical difficulty before, but I suppose it's fitting with the state of the world that we're just going to have to roll with it. So what I'm going to do is a reenactment of what this discussion was about. So I'm talking about Pax Transhumanity. It's my favorite game of the year. And Matt loves it. And then right after the part that you heard, Orion comes in and he's going to be the spoiler. And he says, first of all, I don't think it's thematic at all. I think the cards are there, but, you know, 10 minutes into the game, it's just a bunch of cubes and a bunch of colors. Which is a ridiculous thing to say. Actually, I mean, I'm rolling with this on one take. Not even going to edit it. Well, maybe I'll do a bit of editing. But I'm going to try to be as impartial as possible in this reenactment. Having said that, ridiculous thing to say, because the game's incredibly thematic. And I tell Orion as much. I say the game, every single part of the game. I think at one point I said, there's not a single part of the game that is not thematic. You have the patents. The patents that you can that you can develop, you research certain technologies, and then you get patents that you can use to make other technologies in that area viable. That's super thematic. The fact that when you research something that removes from the board and helps develop other technologies further down, the fact that you have to uh, kind of claim a technology that, but that before you can commercialize it, but that puts it in the spotlight that other people can come. A, come over and uh, disrupt that for you, that you can't then commercialize it for as much money because uh, some news got out that you had claimed you had syndicated that that technological idea. That's super thematic. Every part of the game is thematic. And Orion's like, well, I have nothing against cube pushing games, but it was a cube pusher. And yes, there are literally cubes in the game, but it's still a super, super thematic game and then matt has to come in and again i'm being impartial here this is what happened matt comes in is like well i think i agree with orion and we'll forget about him he's not important in this conversation anyways super thematic game then orion comes in with this theory we've been teasing the theory from the very beginning so the suspense is building here and i don't know what the theory is we haven't discussed it before uh he he Drop this in the beginning of the podcast, Orion's theory about something. Here's what it is. And I think it was really interesting. Orion comes out and says, okay, here's my theory. I think Pax Transhumanity is very similar to Stevenson's Rocket. Both games that you, and by you he means me, like way more than I do. Hey, Orion, how's it going? I think that it's a distinction, a difference between you liking more tactical games, whereas I like more strategic games, because he explains that Stevenson's Rocket, you, your turn comes around, and you just kind of pick something that looks good, and you go on with it, and it's the same with Pax Transhumanity, uh, that it's super tactical, there's not a lot of overall like long-term decision-making, there's not, not a lot of strategy, and he thinks that's the distinction why he dislikes those games more than I do because I have more of a preference for tactical games, whereas he is more of a preference for strategic games. And graciously, I agreed to this a bit because I'm a good debater, communicator, discusser. And yeah, I think he does have a bit more of a preference for strategic games. He certainly plays them better than I do. 
Uh, I'm pretty bad. I'm, I'm better at tactical games than I am strategic games generally. Um, and while I think that's true, I don't think that is the distinction. So I say, here's, after a brief thought, a brief moment of thought, I think about it. I say, here's what I think the, the, the connection is between Pax Transhumanity and Steven's It's Rocket. Both games, you try to put your opponents in situations where their best option is to help you. And so it has this super subtle, super indirect player interaction where you're trying to set up situations where they, it's in their best interest to help you. And Stevenson's Rocket, it's very clear because it's this kind of tempo game where you want to, you want to try to maintain control of the trains, but set it up so that the tempo is such that when that you get to control how the trains merge and how the end of the game sets up, which I guess doesn't make any sense if you haven't played the game, but I guess that's the way we've been talking the whole time anyways. But the point is you want to set up these, these binds, these situations where your opponents are like, well, I guess I push this train, and you're like, yes, that's exactly what I want you to do. In, in Pax Transhumanity, it's kind of the same way, where... You want to get in a position where the kinds of technologies that your opponents are are developing that they're being nudged towards are the kinds of technologies that will help make your strategy more viable. And I think there's a lot of the same types of interactions there. And uh, Orion says, oh, wow, Mark, you're really right there. That's spot on. Everything you say is perfect. Again, impartial recreation of what happened here. Um that I, I hit the nail on the head. So that's the distinction we made, and that's why Orion isn't as keen on Pax Transhumanity. I think I made a joke in there that this is the perfect uh, like epitome of the Thoughtful Gamer podcast and that we're doing a fun top 10 list, and then we have a 15, 20-minute debate diversion about the number one game, uh, which it is. So that was a funny joke of mine. Um, what else happened? Uh, you think of anything, Orion? Oh no, Ryan's coming towards the microphone now. He's got the cat and everything. I'll just say that Mark is clearly impartial and right about everything and has the best debating skills and arguments. Oh wow, that was the perfect thing to say. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah, what what Ryan said. Anyways, that's how the discussion went down. Uh, hopefully you got a, a, a sense of the electric fire that we had in our in our heated arguments here. Our, our good-natured but heated argumentation. Uh, I think that's all that happened. Okay, back to the actual recording. All right, we're going to wrap yeah. this thing up. There you go. You got my secret uh, suspense theory, and now uh, now I'll let Mark do his uh, the Ryan Correa theory comments. of <laughs> divergent <laughs> opinions. <laughs> Passive-aggressive board gaming. <laughs> Well, what, do you guys have a number one game of 2019? Uh, I'd, I'd say Pipeline or Pax Premier, probably. Okay. I think I know what Matt's will be. Really? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure. Goat and Goat, obviously. No, I don't goat think it's and goat. goat. I do think it is on, <laughs> I do think it is one of the games on my list. Wait. Let me look at your list again. I forgot about what your list is. I don't know. Um... Is it the crew? Is that what you're thinking? I, 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 yeah, that's what I. Th- that would be my guess at what your number one would be. Yeah, probably. Honestly, I might. In a sense, Pirate Tricks might be just because it was most consistent, and it's a game that I know that I'll play more in the future. Mm, that's um, a good pick. Uh, the crew, I think, probably has potential to be the number one. I mean, yeah. I've really played that one on one night. And that, that um, foreshadows. Uh, I've written. I think I've written about this, but not yet mentioned it on the podcast. I do think the big, the next big gaming f- trend fad, whatever you want to call it, now that Roll and Write is fading a bit, I, I think the next thing is going to be trick taking. Yeah, and I think the crew is going to kick that off, and we're going to see a, a number of innovative trick taking games over the next two to three years. Happy for it. Happy birthday to Rand. <laughs> That's his dream scenario, right? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, Rand may have a, a good amount of indirect influence on that. He has. <laughs> That's true. He's probably imported a bunch games. of them. <laughs> yeah, that he's imported. I mean, like, there was a, a game 
that I think it's considered a 2020 release, but it would be on my short list for 2020 games is this obscure trick-taking game, like self-published, I think, from somewhere in Asia called American Bookstore. And it was so simple. Like, you could play it with a deck of cards or even a shortened deck of cards. But it was so good because it was a three-suit trick-taking game, like, straightforward. But the twist was you only scored... The cards that you took only scored positively for you if you had the most of that suit. Otherwise, they were negative points. And that's it. And it was so good. <laughs> yeah, nice. Nice. It was so good, and it was and it's instantly shot to near the top of my favorite trick-taking games, because that dynamic was so interesting. It was just casual enough. It had that classic parlor game feel where you could have a conversation while playing, but created a lot of really tough decision points. So I yeah, think trick-taking is going to be the thing, so and I think we'll enjoy that space. more than... Like, we didn't really get into a lot of roll and rights, and there are some that I like, but as a genre of game, I think trick-taking will be more exciting for us here at The Thoughtful Gamer, if it does become the next thing. Oh, definitely. And, um, there's a lot of room for trick-taking as a mechanic in a larger game. Yeah, we'll see. That... I, I did do a review of Jiraku, which did that from a couple years ago. I don't think it was particularly successful at the blend. But I think it'll there'll be games like that that really try to blend it with other genres. I really enjoy trick taking. I'm not particularly good at it, especially when you've had but, some 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 drinks. Yeah, that is true. We we often play trick taking games at the end of the evening, and I've indulged. I'm reminded in that of book. our three hour game of spades. We don't. This is a family podcast. <laughs> I won't say anything more. All right. I think that will wrap up our best of 2019, best and worst of 2019 podcast. Cause I'm not going to, I'm not going to pull any punches there. We played a couple of stinkers, but overall, I think a solid year. I think I liked it better than 2018 on the whole. I think it had better games. Uh, still not 2017 might go down as a legendary year. It doesn't beat that. But in terms of the years we've covered on the podcast, it was a very good year with some very exciting, fun games that I'm, excited to dig more into and a lot of good games a lot of a lot of games on my list that got that kind of six and a half to seven and a half score which indicates a, a good solid game uh, that we didn't mention but I, we've mentioned elsewhere and, and such so a good year for 2019 2020 we'll see how it goes it's certainly going to get disrupted in some way so we'll see we'll see what happens but there are so many games we're so blessed with all the games that we're able to play and all the games that I need to play and haven't played yet and uh, want to go back to and revisit and, and games I, I missed the first time around or came out earlier before I got into board games. There's lots of games to play, even if we don't get as many new releases in 2020, potentially. Anyways. Yeah, our living room is 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 quite literally overflowing with board games. There's a lot of games. It's a lot of games. Anyways, thanks for listening, everybody. Again, the link for Engro Games, our sponsor for this podcast, is in the description to check out those games before the pre-order time ends. Don't forget to check out the thoughtfulgamer.com. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you would like to uh, support the podcast and help keep us going during this time of potentially increased podcast listing <laughs> as people are uh, working from home more and uh, have maybe have a bit more time, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. You get to watch the live streams of our podcast uh, live. That is exclusive to Patreons along with lots of other fun bonuses and benefits uh, other than the satisfaction of knowing that you have assisted us. Also rate and review the podcast. I forgot to mention that one rate and review it on wherever you get your podcasts from. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Good night. <laughs>